Hello, this is the second episode of How To Go. Um, this time I'll be going through a game. This game was played between Go Sagan and some other player whose name is in Chinese characters and I can't read. <laughs> uh, I chose this game because it has some very elegant types of opening problem solving and focuses on some concepts that I think are not well represented in Western literature. Uh, Western Go literature, like, I don't think it's been translated a lot. Um, this level of this video will be fairly high, maybe low dawn, mid dawn level, but it, I think I can explain it in a way that will be still be pretty applicable to high mid Q players and maybe low Q players, depending on the part I'm talking about. Okay, let's get started. So... Gosekin is black, so I mostly, um, and he wins this game very quickly, sorry spoilers, um, I'm a very big Gosekin fan, but he wins this game very quickly, and uh, <clears throat> I think it's really good to learn from games that are one-sided, because you can clearly see the mistakes that were made, or how to capitalize on certain types of mistakes. Okay, so... Black is Gosegan, and this is a very old style Fuseki. Um, this kind of rotating Komoku shape is very common in old Fuseki, although this game wasn't played, uh, relatively speaking, that far back in Go history. But at the time, after the die down of the Shin Fuseki, which some may or may not know is like this huge explosion of uh, opening creativity, and when people started using 4 4 points. Um, then it kind of died down a little and it kind of came back to uh, going back to these more traditional patterns but with a new understanding brought on by the modern play. Uh, modern at that time, not as modern now. So the first interesting move I want to point out is this move, move 6 by white. <clears throat> you notice it's high and in comparison to black's low enclosure at P17. I'll come back to this point and why this is important, but I just want to note it now to kind of keep it in the back of your mind. Okay, black play is a very simple approach. Um, traditional theory is that it's difficult to play a game if you give white two enclosures or give any side two enclosures, so black's going to approach white. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's actually a very subtle reason for this move that I will come back to also. Uh, this is a very common Fuseki. Of course, white could pincer, um, but this stone is, uh, they could maybe play a normal joseki, but it feels like if white plays this way, while this stone works very well with this stone, white is committing completely to this side. Also, if black somehow gets sente, for instance, um, I need to read this out again, but I think... Uh, the normal one, yeah, so let's say if black plays, nowadays you would play C17, but uh, I'm going to play the old style just to make it clear, and white plays here. Now, black could now, could take the second corner, if black somehow got sente, and this would be huge, because now black has two corner enclosures, a fairly good position here, and white could get a big move on the bottom, but white is fairly committed, you know, to this one area, so black can go all out to reduce it, while still maintaining his territory in the upper right, lower right, maybe developing something here, and still could develop something on this side as well, um, this right-hand side as well. So, this type of play is uh, probably why white decided not to pincer, and also opted for a variation that's very simple uh, so that white could get sente to, to approach the bottom right corner afterward. And so, whoops, that is not what was played. And so white plays this and then approaches the bottom right. Um, there are four possible approaches. I will not be considering the two space variations, uh, primarily because they weren't popular at the time and because those types of approaches can encompass a lecture in themselves. And 
Also, they're not as common. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just be going over the decision between the high approach and the low approach. Um, you might say white could split the side, but it's back to the same problem where black has two corner enclosures, and after this, this is a huge lead for black. Two corner enclosures and an ideal extension point is very difficult to deal with as white. Um, so, at this time, I'm going to start think, talking about an idea called tadomari. Tadomari means to take the last large point on the board um, of a certain value. So, like, let's say there's, like, you know, five 20-point moves, and then the rest of them are, after that, it goes down to 10-point moves. A person who takes the last 20-point moves is usually at an advantage because white um, or black, uh, whoever the next player is, can't make a move that is as large as that last move to compensate. Hit, part of this idea, though, is that there is an odd number of large moves of that size, right? Because if there's like five 20 point moves and the next move is 10 points, you're like, oh, okay, I take two 20 point moves, you take two 20 point moves, then I take the last 20 point move. I have 60 points, you have 40. And then you're going to take a 10 point move, so you're at 50, and I have 60 points. So I'm going to be slightly ahead now even though we both just took points back and forth. Of course, if it's an even number, it's not as clear because, you know, there's four 20-point moves. Oh, I have 40, you have 40, then I take the next one, which is 10, right? It's not that big a deal. Um, but typically, if you can manipulate the situation such that you get the last move of a certain size, you'll uh, generally generate a small advantage. And the small advantage um, adds up, in a sense. And it'll become more apparent as the game plays out. So let's first consider what happens if white approaches high. Well, this is an interesting position because there are a lot of variations that black could play, like a pincer to to make use of this enclosure, right? But black could also play a very simple, like almost mirroring white, play this way. But then black. Um, notice this, there's a slight difference here where the stone is low and the stone is high. The reason the stone is high is because black would want to aim then to play along the bottom. And this is Tedomari. It's the last large point on this board. There are still points here and here, but these are relatively mii in value. Their white move might be slightly bigger, but it's still... Uh, and the reason it's bigger is very, very subtle, but... In general, they're pretty much the same value. So the last really large point would be this black move here. And so part of the reason it was so subtle that black played a high approach in the upper left is that it sets up a situation where he, if white plays a high approach in the bottom right, he can create an almost mere opening but make use of the fact that white played e4 instead of e3 to get to this last large point on the bottom and put him ahead. It's a very subtle but very key distinction in this game, and part of the reason that I chose it. And al it's also the reason that, in the game, white decides to play low, so that black can't create this kind of mere opening. Um, one other thing is that, yes, there are variations where white tenuki is here. Uh, at the time, I don't believe tenukiing was common, so I don't think it's something that people would necessarily consider. But let's say black plays, you know, just a move here. This is also Tedomari, right? It's the last large extension from this kind of shape. There isn't really anything to match its size on the board. Of course, white could play something here, but then black could get something on the top. And these are relatively similar in size. Uh, the top one looks bigger, but uh, the one on the left also opens an invasion in this space, so they're roughly the same size. Okay, so this is part of the reason that in the game, white plays a low approach to avoid giving black the last large point on the board. Um, part of the reason I chose this game again was because of the concept of Tedomari. I don't think it's well documented or covered in Western Go literature. So black played a two-space pincer. Classical text tells us, or like really old games like Shusaku and Shuko, uh, not Shuko, uh, 
Shua and Shuho, they'll play this low pincer, or this three space low pincer, because it makes a very good development from the upper right. However, in this case, white is able to double approach the bottom. Let's say something simple. And get to a point on the left that is ideal for this extension. Black can then follow up, but this stone um, at, at R5 is not dead yet. It can still live with moves like these. Of course, this isn't really that bad for black, but I don't think black wanted to play this way because it allowed white to have the flexibility to choose the direction he wanted to play later. Um, another possibility is that white would play something loose, like a two-space, and then pincer. These two stones are flexible, and they'll find some way to manage. But again, white got this last large point here. Black can play the large point at the top, and then white will be perfect to invade and reduce the, this upper right side. If you kind of look at the board, black's main territory is going to be this upper right side. Hmm. But when I look at it, I don't think it's that bad for black. Uh, but this would be my idea behind why maybe black chose not to play this um, R9 stone, but chose to play a two-space high pincer. Also, at the time, two-space high pincering was more of the fashion and more modern because it developed the center more. Hmm. I'll have to look at this more. But yeah, I think the main reasoning is that it does give... Uh, white the ability to develop the bottom side pretty well. There's even Joseki like this. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Not like that, like this. That kind of let white have this loose enclosure, and then this stone is extending here. It's a little large, so black could invade. But with this thickness, black could also white could also invade into black's territory. So. Probably black didn't want to play in a way like this that made the game kind of difficult and give white a lot of options. So black played a two-space side pincer. It's a little different scenario now because when white double approaches or counter approaches, black's follow-up here is very severe on this stone. And now white backs off and black takes the stone. This is fairly big and significant. This stone has a lot less mobility and can't um, live like in the other variation where black needed an extra move to try to actually kill it. To go over that again, right? Black plays out here, comes here, and then white can still live. Of course, if black could try to play this attaching move, but there's so much space here that white can try to make shape somehow and live on this side and fight with this stone. Actually, maybe if it was this case, white might play a three space. So that, yeah, live. And then this stone is fairly far from these stones. So that there's not, it's harder to pressure this stone. And if black tried to invade, whoops. Right? Why could threaten and run out and it's a different game but it feels like white is um, it's harder for black maybe maybe white would force first and then run out it's kind of like a more difficult game for black okay so in the game black played a two space high pincer the most common joseki at the time involved this Kosumi, followed by either a small knights or a large knights. In this game, Gosegen plays a large knights. The normal joseki then would be to play this slide to make a base for this group. This group. But that would allow black to again take Tedomari and get the large last point on the bottom of the board, right? And disrupt the development of these two stones along the bottom and aim at removing their base by sliding under and while also developing these stones. And there's not really a point on the board that white can play that's equal compensation for this. White can, of course, invade over here and it becomes into a fight. 
Um, KGS is lagging, sorry. But it's still not ideal where white's the one who's having to start and pick a fight within black's area. So white has an interesting countermeasure. This is a sort of pseudo Joseki, but it's not very common and well, that's okay, that's not entirely true. It was played for a while, but I don't really think of it as a Joseki because it's almost fundamentally unsound. White plays this move to aim at bridging under. And the idea behind this move is that let's say black cuts and white's able to live with these stones, right? These two stones manage these somehow. Then there's two equivalent options, right? There's Miai. The stone at R10 can make a base at R13 and disrupt Black's sphere of influence, which is almost as big as the point at the bottom, which is a, a point of contest contestion between two um, miniature frameworks, right? The development of two high stones, the point of development between two high stones. So if white can somehow manage this small, these two stones, then white can make, um, then if black takes one point, right, so like a pincer, then white could take the other, or if black takes the bottom, then white could separate and disrupt black's framework, and it's kind of like almost equivalent size. So white avoids giving black tedomari this way, but making an option on the right that is as large, or almost as large as the point on the bottom. So black plays a severe attack. Um, this is kind of a sh uh, I don't know if I agree with it, but the idea is to not become heavy and to gain momentum to make shape by leaning on black stones, which is a common tactic. White attaches to make a base before coming back. Um, this isn't a complete base, but it's saying later white could play here if he wants to make some eye shape or not. White pushes out, and black plays here, which is natural, and then white follows up here to make some eye shape in a base. Notice that because white was trying to avoid the Tedomati situation, white's the one who picked a fight first, right? At a fundamental level, this is two weak white groups against one weak black group. So it's kind of an unsound fight, but it's unavoidable if white wants to avoid giving black the last strategic point on the bottom of the board. Okay, so white plays this way. And black, um, this S3 stone, S3 move, is actually very important because if black captures at R4, it, th it helps the center stones. It threatens to link them up. So it's indirectly supporting these stones, even though white could break through on the side. Notice that if white plays here, um, it's kind of hard for white now. Let's say you connect, and now these are two weak white groups, and it's not really a weak black group at all. Maybe this one stone, but it's kind of iffy. You could Atari, but I don't know. You could cut. <laughs> and again, it's kind of two weak white groups against one weak black group. And now you have an extra move, um, threaten to connect, cut, you know, you can have forcing moves that help, or forcing moves this way that help, and it's kind of a very difficult fight for white. So that's why white doesn't play this counter Atari that you might normally see in other positions. Instead, white extends, black takes, again, threatening to link up on the bottom. White wants to prevent that, so he threatens Ko. And black just calmly pulls back. This is a key point for black. Black could extend, but then white would extend here. And now it's only two weak white groups. And in fact, white's group almost has an eye, or has an eye. So black would be at a disadvantage in this fight. Even if black gets the strategic point on the bottom, white already made a base on the right side. And he's fighting... Um, kind of in a bad position. His group is weaker than White's group. <clears throat> so Black doesn't have time to respond to this move on the bottom side. Instead, Black makes shape by pushing on these stones. White follows up on the Atari 
uh, on the stone that black didn't defend and connects. But unfortunately, this is Gote. You might think, well, now, if white gets another move here, this bottom side becomes very big. But since we're already entering middle game fighting, the direction of play is more important to make use of attacking and uh, dealing with weak and strong groups than it is to make use of points. This is all leading up to a very interesting uh, kind of idea or tactic by black. See, so black forces with R12 knowing that white will have to make shape with this group. If you were black, where would you play now? The most common sense move would be to extend, right? To strengthen the center group and keep the white group kind of weak. But white's group is almost settled. It has some eye shape, and as long as it can lean on black's group, it can make some shape. Instead, yeah, black plays this Atari to start the Ko on the bottom side. This Ko is a way of controlling the momentum of the fight. But it also suddenly makes this bottom white group a lot weaker, because if black wins this Ko, then it has no eye shape. White takes the Ko. This kind of ploy is very useful, but also takes a lot of reading to make sure that the corner wouldn't fall under any backlash, and to make sure that your Ko threats are actually big enough and that you have enough of them. This is a very clearly big co-threat. If white ignores it, by say connecting, then black cuts, and this is huge. The bottom side, if white comes, defends. If white comes this way, you can run out and live on the side. Uh, maybe have to push once, but still, you can live. And this kind of area is way too big compared to the bottom side. So white defends, black takes a code back, white connects because it's a threat, and then black enlarges the co. This is similar to what I was talking about before. By aiming to bridge these groups under, it makes the two other groups, much, two other white groups much weaker because they're fighting against a strong group that has no threat of being captured. White takes a co back, black connects, threatening this cut, Instead of defining the white Atari is to make it bigger, right? <clears throat> this is kind of a common tactic in high-level games, or even, you know, mid-level, high-level games. You want to play this kind of forcing exchange first because it gives you strength and center, and later um, the value isn't as big. Black takes the co, white cuts. If white just takes this point, you know, the stone and follows up, black connects. But even though white has a ponoki here and fairly strong thickness, um, black has a follow up to pull out this stone, you know, just break through, or Atari here, to, you know, to make a co shape and come out. Also, black has a strong, uh, not super strong, but fairly good position on the left hand side, which makes this thickness hard to use. Also, the bottom side is still open to like slides or jumps. So even though there's a ponoki, um, it's black gains points, strength, and the thickness is difficult to use. That's why white chooses to make an even larger co-threat by threatening this entire group. But black ignores and takes the stone, and white extends. So at this point we might say, well, white succeeded. He ended up <coughs> um, creating a small not small really, made a group here that has a fair amount of territory, but black also got a fair amount of points and this white group is suddenly very weak. How do you want to make use of the fact that this group's weak? Black starts by separating with the co shape. The shape isn't so much a co, but it's meant to separate these two white groups from each other. And now even if white descends to start mapping something on the bottom, this group this white group still doesn't have a base, so black can at attack it. Even, and he won't kill it, but by attacking it, he'll be able to reduce all the territory at the bottom that white could try to get. And similarly, if white plays a defensive move, um, something like this, black can slide under and take away the territory, or depending on where the move is, invade directly, aiming to connect up under or run out. White takes the co, 
black plays a threat. This threat is fairly big because it threatens to separate the two and take the corner. Um, so white responds. Black takes the code back. And white plays this move against this corner. Black can't really afford to take the co or enlarge in the code because giving white the corner uh, completely disrupts these two stones and makes it difficult. My computer is being silly. Uh, it makes it difficult to manage. Um, Black's going to be playing on the back foot, and the center influence is kind of counteracted by the stone. So Black defends. White's trying to get forcing moves. He doesn't want to necessarily win the kill, he just wants to make forcing moves to remove the Aji from these stones. But Gosagan is fairly um, adept at making use of despite white trying to remove it. Black's next move is one that I didn't think of but is actually fairly brilliant. This kind of triangle shape. Um, it threatens to Hane next to capture these and also threatens uh, a shortage of liberties on these three stones. These three stones. It also aims to clamp uh, nose attach here. It has a lot of different potential because any way white tries to capture these stones is going to be in a fairly inefficient manner that'll make shortage of liberties and a false eye. You can see that by like, oh cool false, white took a stone but still a false eye and these stones, this stone didn't gain any liberties because it's um, next to these two. Okay, so white pushes through, threatening the corner, kind of maybe mapping something out, and black plays here, threatening to capture these center stones, push up here and make use of this uh, Ajian connection. White completely separates, following up on the threat, and black takes the stone so that the corner doesn't completely die. White plays here, because if white doesn't play here, for example extends, then black will probably... Well, black could play multiple ways. He could probably just play here, preventing white from coming up. The other option is just playing here and winning the capturing race, but this gives white a fair amount of influence. So my guess would be black would go from this side. Black could also maybe play this way. Just taking a chunk in the middle, and <clears throat> even though white comes through, this is fairly large. So white plays here, keeping his stones together, and aiming to come back to fight this co with a cut on the black stones. Before white can do that though, black enlargens the co. White takes, black extends threatening to connect here and killing these while saving the black stones and aiming at the top so it's a fairly big threat white takes black takes back white plays this move it's a fairly good co-threat but it's also not um urgent because after black takes this ponoki helps black to later invade and reduce this area even and white already had an invasion at the C12 that he could play before in this shape anyway. So it doesn't really give white much else that he didn't have before. Well, black wearing this co takes a huge amount of territory and then allows black to set up an attack on these this group. Remember, the group on the bottom is also still weak. So black has taken complete control of this game through using the co at the bottom. White plays a small test of G to make shape and run out. And then black comes back in the corner. This move looks small, but it removes the base of these four white stones, which indirectly makes this group in the center stronger because now it can lean on the top stones when they try to make shape, like this. Black runs out. <laughs> Separating the two groups, keeping his stone strong, attacking this group. White makes a play. This move is separating this group and this group, 
well, indirectly trying to help this group. But the group on the left is actually fairly light and has a fair amount of eye shape. So Black's not immediately concerned with it. Instead, he wants to take care of his group and attack this large white group. White comes back, making a forcing exchange against the corner, and attaches to try to make shape for this group here. Black extends, separating white, <coughs> and then white, um, in good momentum, jumps out to keep the black stone separated. This idea of attaching to push black forward and then jumping is, is called choshi, or is roughly translated to momentum. The idea is that you're inducing white or inducing black to play in a way that makes your move at f12 even more effective. It's a good tactic by white, but it's not enough to overcome the the global balance problems that white has with all the weak groups. And yeah, mostly it's just black. Uh, white has a lot of weak groups. Black separates white, pushes out. White plays a threat against the corner, but it's not well timed. So black's able to come back and actually turn the tables and threaten these two stones, starting to make shape and taking care of his stones over here. White follows up on the corner, but black has a good co uh, to start over here. And so now the T18 stone is actually just a gift to black. If um, if black wins this co, this T18 stone actually becomes completely useless. I'm not sure if white just overlooked this possibility, or he was trying to start a co in order to swing the momentum back. <clears throat> but it actually ends up being a big, pretty big downfall for him. Starts the co. This is a huge threat, right? Aims to take that whole thing. Takes co back. White pulls out his stones here. This is fairly big because now the black stones will die and the white stones will come back to life. But black finishes the co. The major thing is now these stones, black can start mapping something at the top. And black has Sente to come back and play this move. This is also like a Tadomari. It's a huge move. There's no move on the board that competes in terms of size. Right? There's no space as large as this. And also, it's a key point for trying to surround and attack the, this group of white stones that's been left along, alone for so long and indirectly kind of withered because of this ponuki here, the black stones here, the weak white group. <clears throat> it start, it's kind of withered away. So black gets a huge key point despite losing these stones here. White wants to keep... Uh, reduce the top and keep these stones somewhat settled, but black just follows up and takes the um, further surrounds this group, mostly because it's bigger. White runs, aiming, um, quick thing, white's aiming to try to connect these. Black hits here, white connects, and then black leans on this group. This is just a classic example of a leaning attack, building strength to surround this on a large scale. This is um, a key point move. Black is making a wall saying, I'm going to surround this. Black doesn't care about the left side. It's not as big as this area here. White moves out. Black pushes this white group down a bit before coming... Uh, sorry. Oh yeah, I forgot about this. Black pushes white down and then white is worried about these stones falling under attack. So he tries to make a base and then comes back to secure the stone by grabbing the stone. However, this gives black Sente again to make to get to the key point of attacking this group. White tries to play some forcing moves to connect. I think if white thought this was Sente, so that after black defends, white could um, maybe Hane and try to capture these somehow or make uh, some sort of play like this, aiming to capture them. This seems to work. Uh, maybe, maybe work, I'm not sure. Yeah. But, um... Instead, black just calmly defends because even after white uh, makes fairly good linking shape between this connection, it's not great, but it's like, possible, Black plays this move, which aims at two different peeps, or two different cuts. And after a few more moves that white plays out, white quickly resigns because 
this whole entire bottom region is now blacks. Black has taken this upper right. Fair amount of potential to make some extra points here by black. Black has good end game with this um, Hane. I'll just play it, actually. <laughs> now let's say white plays here. Black has fairly good end game to reduce this. Black has still the potential to come back and attack this group. And you might think, oh, why doesn't uh, white attack this bottom group, maybe, you know? But it's actually, there's a case of Miai. Black can either connect up between these two stones or capture these stones. It was part of the idea behind the leaning attack. So there's really no weaknesses for white to try to use, and black has a commanding position over the board. Okay, so let's recap the key points from the beginning. White played a sm uh, this high move that created an imbalance on the board, right? It's not that it was a bad move, but it became a way of either taking advantage of the game or creating a weakness that could lose the game. Black took advantage of this stone by approaching the upper left. Black, because there's still an open corner, or Black can make a second corner enclosure, White is limited to trying to take Sente from this approach in the upper left, which causes White to play this variation. However, because White chose a simple variation that was probably calculated by Black, White can't really play a high approach because, um, I'll play the simple one, Black can create a case of Tezomari, where he gets the last large point on the board just by creating a mere opening, right? This point is not replicated on the top side because the P17 stone is low. So white's move on the top is nowhere near as big as this black move on the bottom, which has a follow-up at sliding and undermining the base of these stones. And it's for that reason that white approach is low and black is able to pincer. But this pincer is still ideal for setting up Tedomari on the bottom side because it reduces the viability of a double approach by white by leaving a severe follow-up on the white stone here. If you have a less severe follow-up, then white could double approach. And this stone still retains a lot of Aji. And white um, kind of has Miai options of taking care of this stone and dealing with this side. Right? Uh, whoops. Black could take this stone. White actually, now that I'm reviewing it again, probably wouldn't live here right away because it's Gote. But instead, white could try to play up here. Black would contest and then reduce the top, right? Reduce the side and then holding back the option of living over here, still holding back this option of expanding. It's not that it's bad for black, but it gives, black, it gives white a lot of options for how to play. So, so by pincering in a way that reduces the white's ability to double approach by leaving a more severe follow-up, because this move doesn't completely kill the stone, but it hugely reduces the amount of Aji it has, and definitely doesn't allow it to live, it has a much bigger follow-up. So the more severe pincer forces white into this variation, where black can set up a Tedomari situation on the bottom, where he can get the last crucial key strategic point. You could say white might take the point, but then these stones are without a base, and black can gain control of the game by attacking them. If white takes this point, then black gets the last major point on the bottom and is ahead. So white goes for this interesting counterattack move to try to make Miai of the right and the bottom, but it relies on black... Um, <clears throat> it relies on white being able to settle this group uh, without taking too much damage. But because this move is fundamentally unsound, in the sense of two weak white groups against one, only one weak black group, the game slowly spirals out of control through black's use of tactics um, and manipulating the Koaji to gain control of the fight. And a well-timed Ko with good threats 
for setting up the threats here, and then setting up the co, because Black knows he has more threats, and because it's a decisive factor, leads Black to gaining a favorable position. White must follow up on the co threat. Black creates a favorable position by separating white and making this group extremely weak while leaving Aji in this group with this co shape in the cut. And then white tries to fight back, but black has very, very nice Tessujin to get control of the rest of the game. And from there, it's a simple matter of black cleaning up a favorable, a favorable position with many weak white groups across the board. So one interesting thing to note is that white falls into trouble mainly because white um, is trying to find ways of countering black's global strategy. Getting to the key strategic points first allows black to naturally gain a favorable, favorable position and forces white to make moves that are not uh, fundamentally sound but are necessary if white doesn't want to fall behind. So this use of maintaining, kind of knowing the flow of the game to get to the key points is really the key aspect of Black's play in this game and allows Black to um, not gain a lead, but threaten to gain a lead and force White into unfavorable fights. Okay, I hope you found this game, is, game interesting. This review is fairly long. I'll try to cut down on the next one. And thank you for listening to the second episode of How to Go.